All right, let's start our, our new series uh, that we're starting uh, this week for the for the next several weeks here as we get into Christmas, and that is a, a, a series on joy. joy. Just one word, joy. We did we did thankful last time. Now we're doing joy. I don't know why we're doing one word series, but I, I don't plan them out. I don't do what I think. I, I was going a whole different direction. My, my thoughts and processes were in a whole other thing to do for a Christmas series. or and, and the Lord's like, I don't even want you to do a Christmas series, but you're going to do a series on joy. And I'm like, well, how much more Christmas can you get than joy? Joy to the world, for the Lord has come. You know, It's like every almost half the Christmas songs talk about the joy that we have this Chris, in the Christmas season. Every, every uh, Christmas Hallmark movie you watch has talking about joy and you know, it's the season is all about joy. And the Lord's like, no, you don't understand. Joy is not a season. Joy is not a feeling. Joy is not an emotion. It's not a, a uh, um, just a, a seasonal thing, a, a, a period of time. Uh, you know, it, it is a spiritual force. Joy will accomplish a lot in your life if you'll apply it, if you'll use it. So what is joy? I just wanted to give us some some. Uh, um, dictionary definitions it says a feeling of great pleasure and happiness and the, and the, if you take the word joy in, in pretty much every spirit, scriptural reference and you take the word joy whether it's Greek or Hebrew and you translate that word it'll come up gratefulness and joy those two, two prevail as to how that word's translated and you know it's not a um it is more than just the de the uh, this this ah, come on tongue work. My brain is going ten mile an hour, and my my tongue's going hundred mile an hour, and they can't get synced in together. Sometimes <laughs> they just run each other over. Um, but uh, you know the 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 joy that we're talking about, the spiritual scriptural joy, the spiritual force of joy, is not just a happy good feeling. That's what I want us to get to understand. That's what Christmas joy that we talk about, you know, through our Christmas songs, through all the Christmas movies, is that that's what the kind of joy we're talking about. If if conditions are right, then I'm joyful. I can have joy. If if in a half hour program or an hour and a half movie, the the th conditions can work out and the, they can get rid of the bad guy and get the girl and you know. Isn't that the theme of almost every movie is to is to get rid of the bad guy and get the girl, you know? And sometimes the bad guy is the good guy who ends up with the girl. But he ends up being a good guy, you know. You gotta get rid of the bad guy. You get, you get how do you say that? Get rid of the bad boy and get anyhow. <laughs> that was craziness. All right. The I made you guys giggle, so that's good. That's all right. The joy of the Lord, right? You know, you just, you got to express it. And, and joy does have an expression, and we're going to get to that in some future weeks. Um, but gladness is probably a, a the best definition that Scripture gives us if we take the Greek and Hebrew word and, and translate it, that joy and gladness is, is more, it's not a feeling, it is a force, it is a decision, it's a... a uh, we decide to be joyful or to be glad. All right? So we'll get into this and we'll, it'll all make sense here in a minute. So we Scripture talks a lot about the joy of the Lord. Uh, it is gladness of heart. And, and what that gladness of heart comes from is from knowing God. It comes from abiding in Christ, having that relationship, not just a an introduction to Christ at salvation, and then we and then we go off and live our life, but abiding in Christ. That's that everyday relationship with Christ. That's what will bring true glad, true joy and gladness. Is that when we knowing God and abiding in Christ. And um, 
me say that. Being filled with the Holy Spirit. That it is that relationship we have with the Trinity of God, with the with the three part God that we serve and we live with the God the Father, that we that knowing Him, that having that knowledge and understanding, and the only way we get to do that is we read our chapter every day at least, and we study things, and we read extra books, and we read um, commentary, and we listen to podcasts, and we watch sermons, and we do all that stuff, and we from that we uh, get to know Him. Knowing God is not just knowing about Him. Because we can know God from other people's perspective. We know God because other people know Him. And we know how they know Him. No, we need to know Him for ourselves. It's like knowing a famous person. You know, somebody that you've watched on TV, maybe in multiple shows or multiple movies, and you think, well, I kind of know that person. You don't have no clue who that person is. You know who the characters that they've played and who they've acted like. You know them from the standpoint of what other people say about them. But you need to know God personally for yourself. You need to know how he thinks, how he, his sense of humor. You need to know his, his likes, his dislikes. He tells us in Scripture to love what he loves and to hate what he hates. He hates lying. He hates sin. He hates um, deceit. You know, but what he loves is joy. He loves faithfulness. He loves those that will be diligently serve him. Those that will love him back, he loves. He loves those that obey his commandments. And, and so we need to know that. We need to know God. We need to know him. The other thing is that we abide in Christ, meaning that what he has accomplished for us, we live in that. So if he's accomplished healing for our bodies on the cross, then we got to live in divine health. we got to live in that healing process. If He has provided, if He's taken our poverty and given us His wealth and given us His, His prosperity, then we need to live in that. So we abide in Christ. The other thing is to have the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Jesus, before He left the earth, He said, I'm going to send you another comforter, another helper, and He will live in you. He's not going to just come and go and, and just kind of, you know, whenever you need him, he'll, he might show up, but he will abide in you. He will live in you. He will, you know, that baptism of the Holy Spirit is, is the, uh, the, anal- the picture that we can paint is as of a sunken ship. It's baptized. It, it is covered in water inside and out. Every orifice, every little place is, is covered in water. And that's how the Holy Spirit comes in us when we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit. When we receive the baptism in the Holy Spirit, we are engulfed. We have Him not on, only on us, but in us and abiding through us in every way. All right. In, um, in Deuteronomy 28 and 47. Huh? The computer shut off. Boy, well, isn't that cool? You know, don't you love technology? It is awesome because it, it, it helps you to go old school. You know, it reminds you. That's why I always make sure I have my notes printed. Uh, I've, I've been trying, been thinking about going to a tablet, and my concern is, what if the tablet doesn't work? And what I know is, if I print them, the paper always works, unless I drop it in a mud puddle outside and the ink runs or something. You know, I still have my notes. And then the other thing is, I want my Bible. I want, I want it right here with me case that the computers don't work like they're doing right now. So Deuteronomy 28, and we, we know that Deuteronomy 28 is the blessing chapter uh, where God describes the blessing. You know, verse 1 says, And now it shall come to pass if you diligently obey the voice of the Lord your God to obey, to observe carefully all His commandments, which I command you this day, that the Lord God, that the Lord your God, will set you high above all nations of the earth, and and all of these blessings shall come upon you and overtake you because you obey the voice of the Lord your God. So it's all these blessings, and it goes on clear through verse 14 of all the blessings. But then in verse 15, it goes the other direction, and it shows us all the curse that if you don't do these things, 
then this curse will come on you. And here's the good news. Jesus redeemed us from the curse of the law. Amen? So we can, we can take verses 1 through 14 and live them because that's where we live, is in the blessing. We live in the blessing because Jesus redeemed us from verse 14 through what? 20, or not 20, uh, 40, I think it's 44, 45. Somewhere in there is where the, the list of all the curses end. And so there's a lot more verses about the curse than there is about the blessing, but we need to live in the blessing. So let's look at verse 27, or 47, excuse me, verse 47. It says, Because you did not serve the Lord your God with joy and gladness of heart for the abundance of everything. So all these curses are going to come on you. Why? Why, if you don't do these things, what? why? Because you did serve the Lord, but you didn't serve Him how? Are we up? Are you pointing at me? It's, it's trying. Okay. <laughs> I thought you were pointing at me like we're good to go. Um, so when we, when we look at this verse, we're not, um, we're not denying the fact that the children of Israel served God, that they were God's people and they served Him. It's the fact that they did not serve Him with joy and gladness. So how are we serving God? Are we serving Him grudgingly? Like, well, I'm a Christian, so i got to do certain things. i got to act a certain way. i got to be certain things. I can't. I can't uh, laugh out loud at uh, you know coarse jokes and things that are a little off color. I gotta, I gotta you know kind of like, you know even though I think they're hilariously funny, you know. <laughs> and no, we need to be children of God, and we need to serve Him with gladness, with joy and gladness. So, if we don't serve Him in that way, with is this the New Living? Hey, let's look at this one. Let's look at the New Living. It says, if you do not serve the Lord your God with joy and enthusiasm for the abundant benefits you have received. If you, you know, you've got to come to grips with how much benefits you have received from the Lord. You have received tremendous abundance of, of blessing, of, of goodness, of the grace of God. You know, grace provides what faith can receive. And, and we understand that our faith can receive anything Jesus said you can move mountains, you can accomplish great things with your faith, then we need to receive all that He has for us by faith. So we got to serve God with joy and gladness. Well, isn't joy and gladness a nice, warm, fuzzy feeling that we have at Christmas? We just have Christmas joy. It's just all nice and rosy and everything's good. No, joy is a spiritual force that we need to apply in our life. We need to accomplish great things with it. And we need to, joy and gladness are not, um, how do I say this? It's like we, we talk about love. And, and in, our, um, in our society, we talk about love. And it's more about an emotion, a feeling, a warm fuzzy that, that we love each other, lovey-dovey. And we, you know, we have a nice feeling about each other. And that's not the love of the Bible. That's not God's love. That's not agape love, the kind of love that God loves. He loves unconditionally. In other words, he, he can't turn away. He can't stop loving. He can't stop being good to us. He can't stop favoring us, stop blessing us, just because He is love. And we need to love that way. Well, joy and gladness is how we need to serve the Lord. And that's, a, that's not a feeling. That's not a warm fuzzy. That is what we do. Because we know Him, because we abide in Christ, because we're baptized in the Holy Spirit, we can abide, we can serve with joy and gladness because we know the answer. See, here's the thing. When bad times come, when life turns us sideways, when our head ends up where our feet used to be, when it just knocks us for a loop, we can be glad. We can have the joy of the Lord. We can stay in gladness because we know Him and we abide in Christ and the Holy Spirit is on the inside of us directing us and leading us and teaching us all things and showing us things to come. Amen? That's the good word right there. I needed that. Okay, Nehemiah 8 and 10. Or can we throw it up there? Nehemiah 8 and 10. It says, Then he said to them, Go your way, eat the fat, drink the sweet, and send 
portions to those from whom nothing is prepared, for this day is holy to our Lord. Do not sorrow, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Now I love the, the instruction in the upper in the first parts of the verse is to take the goodness of God, take what He has provided that's good, eat the fat, eat drink the sweet, do you know when when I, I'm serious, there's some people that can't do nothing but eat skinny. You know what I mean? This not food. I'm not talking about about food, but just how they live their life. They live it in poverty. They live it in lack. Just mentally, their thought process is always about, I got to, I got to hoard up. I got to save what little bit I have, and not just stuff, but intellectual capacity, way of thinking, the way of doing things. And they, they're just always in that poverty mindset, and they always drink the bitter. You know what I mean? The bitter. They're always just, they're all puckered up and bitter in life. And things never work out. Things aren't good. And if they are good, well, that's not going to last. Things are going to, you know, it's going to get worse. It's going to, you know, and they just live a bitter life. And God's in instructing us to eat the fat and drink the sweet. And send, and then from that, then send portions to others that haven't prepared. We need to be a blessing to others. We need to take the goodness of God that he's put in us, the fat, the sweet, and now we need to give it to others. We need to prepare it for others to have. This preparing, you know, is to uh, send portions to those whom nothing is prepared. In other words, we need to do the preparing. We need to prepare portions for other people. Well, what portions are we preparing? The goodness and the grace of God. Be kind. Be good. Be gentle. Be nice. Be, be loving and, and good to people. And then we will put into them the fat and the sweet that God has put into us. And, and so... That's all great and good, but here at the very end it says, for the joy of the Lord is your strength. Well, all of that will lead us to what? To joy. When we are good to others, when we take the sweetness and the goodness that God has put in us and we give that away, that's when the joy of the Lord becomes our strength. Now, when, when we're talking about strength, we're, just, we're, not, we're talking about strength in every area. What we talked about, spiritually, physically, financially, socially. In every area of life, we're strong. We're not going to, to be weak in one area and strong in others, but we're going to be strong across the board. That's prosperity. That's true Bible prosperity. I'm not going to be all financially strong and then be an idiot, you know, and be a real jerk and just treat people nasty. No, I'm going to be, I'm going to be strong in every area. Socially, I'm going to influence people. I'm going to be good to people. I'm going to go out there and be kind and nice and gentle with people and so that I can influence them with the goodness of God. I'm going to be strong in my physical body. I'm not just going to let aches and pains hold me down, but I'm going to be the person of God that He's called me to be. Receive my healing. And oh man. Okay, Galatians 5 and 22. Are you there yet? <laughs> Anthony's back there. I'm there. I got it on the screen. <laughs> okay. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, and faithfulness. And we could go on with the, go to 23. Uh, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Let's go back to 22. It says, but the fruit of the Spirit. So that Holy Spirit is abiding in you, that you have received the baptism in the Holy Spirit, and He's now living in you. He is living through you. He has some fruit. He has some things that He produces. He has some ways in which He works and operates. He has some outcome that He's expecting us to have. He has fruit. Fruit is the production. It's what you what happens in your life. You are you can produce sourness you can produce lemons and you can produce you know uh what's that little fruit oh, what is that thing kiwis they're real real bitter they're real you know they no i'm not talking kiwis what is it they make they grow them in israel not olives but not lemons figs figs are not very tasty you ever eat a fig i never have but from what I hear, they're not very tasty. 
But yet, Jesus went to the fig tree trying to get it. Because he was hungry. He wanted to have the fruit. Well, if we're producing in us, can people come to us and pick us? Can they pick off of us and we're not, we're not just producing some straggly little nasty looking thing that nobody wants? Is that what we're producing in our Christian life? Or are we producing big, beautiful fruit that everybody wants to get a hold of, that people want to come and pick off of us and, and receive? Is, it, is, is that blessing, that joy, that, that strength that we have, is it showing up? in a way that other people want to pick fruit off of us? Or are we all puckered up and, and drinking the sour, drinking the what's not sweet, but drinking the bitter? You know, anyhow. But the fruit of the Spirit, and, and you know, it goes through this whole list, but one of the things in that list, now, does the Spirit of God operate in the power of God through the, through the, um, the strength of God, through the, What's the words I want here? Come on. Let me think. It's, how does, if we know God, then we know how he operates, how he does things, how he, how he thinks, how he, how he just accomplishes things. Well, God's never wishy-washy. He's never uh, kind of, Fluffy, kind of, you know, uh, obscure, kind of shady. You know, he's never, he's always consistent. He's always bright. He's always strong. He's always, you never, you never wonder where God is on a subject. You know exactly how he stands, what he thinks, what he, what he laughs about. You know who he laughs about? Is the people that think they can over, out, outdo him and overthrow him. That's who he laughs at. I, I, I love scripture that. That Satan rose up and he's he's like I'm gonna be this and I'm gonna do that and I'm 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 gonna do all this stuff and people do the same thing like I'm gonna be the greatest and you know I'm gonna do all this and and God sits back and he laughs and he just finds it humorous that we think we're so something outside of him but when we say God in me will accomplish all this he steps up and says yes sir son I'm gonna do that in you and I'm gonna accomplish those things. And I'm going to cause you to be what you believing me, believing for me to be. I'm going to cause that to happen in you. When you say, I'm the healed of God, and I'm, God is my healer, he's my provider, he's everything I want or ever will need. I ha he has nothing I have, and he has everything that I want, and, and I know that he will bless me with it. And he says, yes, sir, I'm going to step up and do that. But when we step outside of him, and we say, I'm going to be, I'm going to do, I'm going to have all this, then God just laughs. He's like, good luck. Hope that all works out for you, but I think I know which direction it's going. It's going down. So we need to understand that, that in the fruit of the Spirit, these are the attributes of God. This is how God thinks. This is how he works. This is how he operates in our life, in, every, in everyone's life. He operates in love and joy and peace. And so all these we can kind of, well, yeah, God is all these things, but then we look at that word joy and we go, that's a feeling. That's a warm, fuzzy, you know, Christmas joy kind of thing. You know, no, joy is a spiritual force and God operates in that spiritual force. He operates in the spiritual force of love, of joy, of kindness, of goodness, and all these uh, Galatians 5 fruits of the Spirit stuff. And so are we going to operate in that same way? Are we going to do things the way he's done them? Are we going to do things the way he, he's do, he wants? Are we going to do things his way in our life? And if we will do that, we will apply the spiritual force of joy and gladness because we know him and because we abide in, in Christ and because the Holy Spirit is in us. And that's how we will accomplish and, and receive and operate in the joy of the Lord. The joy of the Lord is our strength. It is his his empowerment in us, that we know Him. We don't, we don't guess about We don't have to hope and wish that God will operate in a certain way or do certain things. We know that because we know Him. Amen? All right, then. Well, that's, that's all for today's installment of joy. <laughs> um, we're going to continue on with this. The Lord's like, you know, there's way more to this than I even understand, that I know. 
and he and and he's you know he said he would uh, reveal them to me and instruct me in these things and as he does I'll bring them out to you that's how this whole thing works God gets on me and then I get on you you know God instructs me and then I instruct you and it's just how how church works how every church works just how the process of the the kingdom of God works is that God moves on his men he instructs them he leads them and he and he uh, speaks to them and then they go and speak to the people that they're instructed to speak to it's it's fun to, to read Old Testament scripture and how the prophets would hear from God and that's what they were they were prophets they prophesied what God said they just repeated what God said to them well it's funny they didn't always prophesy to the whole nation or the whole city or the whole crowd sometimes they went to one person one man one a lot of times it was to the king or it was to a high priest or it was to you know some individual and they would prophesy the word of God to them you know individually and that's what that's what God has always done that's his way his process and that's what he does here with us or in every church that's how he works is that he instructs the man of God and then the man of God can then teach um, you know we we uh, the whole the whole process of discipleship is a is a two-sided thing there must be a discipler the person who disciples people but there also must be people who give themselves to be discipled, to be trained, to be instructed. And the, you know, the, the work of ministry is that the fivefold ministry, evangelists, pastors, teachers, uh, prophets, and apostles, I got that way out of order, apostles, uh, anyhow, that those five ministry gifts, those ministry offices, their instruction, their, their, their objective, their, what they're supposed to do is to train and to teach people how to do ministry and and how to accomplish the ministry of the work they're not to do ministry they're to teach how to do ministry and so that's what pastors should be doing you shouldn't be calling your pastor oh, now here I'm meddling you shouldn't be calling your pastor to pray for you or to do your praying for you excuse me I said that wrong you shouldn't be calling your pastor to do your praying for you if you have a sick loved one in the hospital, you need to go lay hands on them. You need to go pray for them. You need to spend time in your closet, in your quiet place, praying for them. You need to do, accomplish those things and not push that off on somebody else who you think might be spiritual. You need to be spiritual. That's what God's called us to do. We need to be the spiritual people, not rely on somebody else that we think is spiritual. 